You are probably breaking the law right now. I don't know if you ever thought about that. I was wondering this week, how many laws do we have in the United States? How many federal laws do we have? And I tried to look this up, and apparently there's no, nobody's quite sure. Uh, the law books are, are so immense and, such, and kind of messy, apparently, that it's hard to pinpoint Depends on what you say, mean by law, depends on what you mean by statute, but no one's really sure. There, it's, it's in the thousands, they say. It's about in the thousands. Um, one of the things I was looking up said, the Congressional Research Service and the American Bar Association simply do not have enough staff to adequately categorize every law that we have on the books here in America. There was an attempt, apparently, in 1982, uh, Congress made an attempt to get a solid handle on it, to figure out how many laws do we actually, if we're passing laws all the time, how many laws do we have? And they spent years working on this and researching this, and the answer they came up with after a couple years was, we don't know. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, it's in, like I said, it's in the thousands. And if you're talking about regulations, federal regulations, then the, the number becomes pretty astronomical. The IRS code alone is three and a half million words long. Sim simply just on the IRS. If you were to print it out, it'd be, it'd be a huge book, thousands of pages. Uh, no one would have time to read it. There are 20,000 federal, federal regulations on gun ownership alone. So there's a, there's, you're probably guilty of something, is what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> needless to say. And some of you, as I look out, are probably more guilty than others. But this, and this is kind of how we think of our relationship with God sometimes. Uh, we look at the, the federal law book, or, and, and that's not even considering state laws and local laws. And we think, uh, when we think about God, we have to imagine I'm probably guilty of something. There's probably, if I think long enough, if I look at my life long enough, and some of you don't need to look at your life long at all, and you realize I'm probably guilty of, of one of these things. Is how many of us uh, were raised, many of us grew up with this concept of God. We grew up just feeling guilty. I, was, I grew up Catholic, and uh, one of the things you're supposed to do as a Catholic is every so often, and if you're in school, they make you do this, you have to go to the confessional. And if you're, you're a kid and you're trying to think, of, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? And you just, all you have to do is think for a couple minutes and you can dig some stuff up and you're supposed to confess it and do all this stuff and it just builds this kind of sense of guilt inside of you. Um, and I know it's not just Catholics. I've, I've met many Nazarenes and many Baptists who also grew up with the same guilt, uh, that, this complex that we have. We're probably guilty of something. When we look at the Old Testament laws, the laws in the Old Testament that were made for the nation of Israel, uh, it's a little more simple than the United States law code. There are 613 laws that can be found in the Old Testament. If you go through and just take out all the laws, there's 613 of them, and that's still pretty difficult, still a lot. Again, we're, we're wondering, how is it possible that we're supposed to be doing all these things? How is it possible that we're supposed to be not guilty? Um, how is it possible that we're supposed to be holy when we're probably guilty of something out there. We, the last couple of weeks, we were talking about everyday holiness. What does that mean? Just in an everyday, day-to-day -day life, what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean that God has called us to a certain thing? How are we supposed to live uh, with this calling on our lives? The last couple of weeks, we looked at a couple of the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah, you remember, had this vision of the throne room of God, and he couldn't even look and see God's face. He just fell down at his feet in despair. And one of the things we, we saw in that vision is that is what we're called to do. When in, in light of God, that's our only reaction is to despair of ourselves, to seek forgiveness. And you remember Isaiah was cleansed by God in his vision, but not because of anything he did. It was because he simply despaired of himself. Last week, we looked at the prophet Zechariah, another prophet who came a little bit later than Isaiah. He had a vision. He saw um, uh, God and the high priest of Israel, and then there was the accuser, Satan, there. And Satan is busy accusing him uh, before God. But what happens? God says to Satan, get away from me. I've made them clean. And he takes the dirty clothes off, and he gives them fresh, and he gave them fresh clothes in the vision. 
And so here again, we looked at last week how the need to just go to God over and over again as much as possible, not only for our own forgiveness, but to extend forgiveness. We've been looking at these things about what it means to be holy, what it means to be cleansed by God. But now I want to ask the question, well, what do, what do we do now? How do we live? Yeah, okay, we understand the message that it's God who makes us clean, it's God who makes us holy, but what are we supposed to do on just a daily, day-to-day basis? Uh, how are we supposed to follow all these laws? How are we supposed to be the, the good, holy Christian people that God has called us to be? Well, we're going to switch to the New Testament today. This is a passage from Romans chapter 13, and Paul gives us, um, Paul, the author of Romans, gives us, is going to give us a helpful clue on how to live the Christian life that we're called to. I'd like to read to you Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. It's found in your bulletin there as well. Paul says, let no debt remain outstanding except for the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is is the fulfillment of the law. Let's pray. Lord, we are gathered together again as your church, gathered together as your people, and Lord, I pray that you would quiet our spirits down. Lord, I pray that you would quiet our souls down, that we would be able to hear a word from you today. And Lord, I pray that you would be with uh, me as I'm here delivering uh, the, the message that you've given to me. And Lord, I pray that, uh, I pray that you would just let it be your message, Lord, and let it not be my message. Lord, I pray that you would just do whatever you want to with this service. We give you permission today to do whatever you want to in our own hearts, and we'll be grateful for it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the great things about church, about coming together as a church, here's a quick confession, is not in my sermon or anything, but just the last day today, even this morning, you just, I just feel kind of blah, you know? And it's just one of those biological things maybe. You know, you just wake up, you're not feeling it. And it happens to pastors too. And unfortunately, pastors sometimes have to give sermons. <laughs> and, when, and, and it's like you can't help it. Sometimes you just feel blah. But isn't it awesome that we come together as a church and I see Loretta worshiping and I hear everyone else singing and I think, boy, it's not about me. And sometimes I'm going to be in that valley and sometimes I'm not going to be thinking, feeling it or thinking it. But we come together as a church, and I just draw on the strength of everyone else, you know? I draw on that faith, and I realize we're all singing and praising God together, and it's not about what I'm feeling. I can't, I don't, it's not about me mustering up some kind of emotion to make, it, make me feel good. It's about, you know, God's, God's present here whether you feel it or not, Chad. And we're all singing God's name together, and we're all here gathered together. And when we gather together, God's here with us. No matter you feel it or not. And that's all. I, I need that today. So, you know, I need your prayers today as, we, as I get through this sermon here. Uh, but it's just one of those days, you know, where I'm just kind of feeling blah. But, boy, it's great to be together as a church and, uh, and know that just God's present no matter what is, is going on. Boy, you got to come to church. <laughs> uh, when you're feeling blah, when you're feeling down and out, that's the times you feel like, I don't feel like, I don't feel it. I don't feel like going to church even. Boy, those are the times you need to be there. Because that's when the church can help you through those times. Uh, anyway, that's a little mini-sermon. Free mini-sermon for you guys. But Paul really helps us out here in these verses, doesn't he? Um, he says, forget about all those laws. He doesn't say forget about all those laws. Forget I said that. He says, think about it like this. The entire law can be summed up really by the commandment to love one another. He says you're, you can sum up the whole law with that command alone. He says, you're not going to be, think about the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. He says, listen, if you love one another, then you're not going to murder them. You're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to steal. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. And he has an interesting way of thinking about this commandment on us, because it is a command on us. There's a lot of Christians that say, well, I'm forgiven. I just do whatever I want. Well, wait a second. There's still a command on us. There's still a calling on our lives. And he has an interesting way of saying this. He says, um, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Sounds like he's saying, you shouldn't have any debts. 
which is one thing, and we got a lot of people here working on that one. <laughs> okay, we shouldn't owe anybody anything. Yeah, I'm working on that. He says, but the main point is this. You should consider yourself to be indebted to one another in love. You should consider that you owe someone an unpayable debt of love. He says, that needs to be our mindset. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. That's the point. You ever have a friend owe you money? You ever, or more or a family member or something? Or, or you ever owe a friend or a family member money? And then you, you maybe see him again. You see him a month later and nobody's said anything about it. And there's kind of that weird tension. <laughs> uh, they owe me money. Maybe they got a new set of clothes or something. Or they're driving a new car. And you think, uh, what about that money that I gave you? It just kind of, it affects the relationship, doesn't it? When there's that debt, that's, uh, that's that outstanding debt. I think Paul says that's the way that we need to think about our relationship with every, everybody. We need to think that we owe a continual debt of love to one another. And that continual debt that we owe one another, that should affect our relationship. It should affect the way we think about people. When we meet people, we need to be thinking of it to ourselves, uh, I owe this person still love. I owe them uh, we should be thinking, uh, it should be on our minds when we see people or meet people. Um, and this debt of love that we're called to, that Paul says we're called to be thinking about, it doesn't ever get paid. You never can pay the thing in full. Uh, and you can't restructure it. You can't call up one of those 1-800 numbers and have someone restructure this debt of love. It's kind of like a student loan. You can't get rid of it. You can't lose it. It's, it, it comes with you. You can't declare bankruptcy on this one. Uh, it doesn't ever get paid. He says, this is the fulfillment of the law, though. This is the one command we're supposed to be living out, the one command that we're supposed to be concentrating on above all else. And isn't that great that he's able to sum up everything with one word, love? Wouldn't it be great if we could sum up the IRS code in one word? Wouldn't that make it a lot easier? If the IRS just said, forget all that, just basically, just, they would probably say pay. That's, that's our one word. But God, uh, Paul says the, the fulfillment of all the law is summed up in this uh, command to love. Paul undoubtedly got this from Jesus himself. There was a few times where Jesus said this very thing. And in one occasion, Jesus was ask, asked point blank by the leaders of the, the Jewish leaders of his day, which one of these 613 laws that we have in our Old Testament, and they wouldn't have called it the Old Testament, they would have just called it the scriptures, the Torah, which one of these 613 laws is the most important? And this was a real debate they would have at that day because you would have to kind of judge some laws to be more important than other laws. For example, one of the laws in the Old Testament said you're supposed to circumcise your son on the eighth day he's born. But wait a second, what if the eighth day he's born is a Sabbath day, for example? Well, we're not supposed to do anything on a Sabbath. So, uh, which one is it? Do, is, is circumcision more important? Am I supposed to break the Sabbath so I can get them circumcised? Or am I supposed to break the circumcision law so I can honor the Sabbath? So they, and they would, that was just one example of this, this uh, debate that they would constantly have back and forth. Which one's more important? And they, Jesus is walking by and they get Jesus together, or they get Jesus and in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, they say, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Help us out here. And Jesus replied, he gives a point-blank answer. Jesus replied, here it is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. And he says, and forgive, and not just that one, but here's another one. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So here it is, same thing. Here it is. Here's the basis of the whole thing. Here's what we're called to. Here's what we need to concentrate on, and it's simply love. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, at first, that may be, see, it's maybe, it seems easy. I feel like maybe you're off the hook a little bit. Oh, I just have to love. Uh, in fact, many think, well, what's, what's so special about that? Why do, I, why do we need Jesus for that? Why do we need church for that? Why do we need Christianity for that. Why do I got to wake up on Sunday and come to church <laughs> to hear that? Um, in fact, many critics are quick to point out all religions are basically saying the same thing. And you'll, you'll hear that. I'm sure you've heard this, this uh, being said. Even non-religious people, 
they can be loving, right? They can um, do that. They can be a good person. And so you hear this all the time that people say, uh, everybody's basically saying the same thing and all religions are basically saying the same thing and it's basically something like the golden rule and it's basically something like be a good person. That's all we're supposed to do. Um, well, what is, what, is that right? What is the difference then? What do we need Jesus for? In our culture, um, is, is all about love nowadays. Everybody's all about love, but uh, and the culture is also not very religious. So why do we need Jesus? What's the difference here? Uh, I think when we look at it, though, what our culture says about love is much different than what Jesus is calling us to. And in fact, some, many of the critics are right. There's a lot of very uh, similar things in all the religions throughout the world. Most religions do have something like the golden rule. They do have something like what Jesus teaches. The, uh, I want to read through a couple of these for you. The Baha'i faith, which is growing in immense popularity, the Baha'i faith, which is an Eastern religion, uh, has this in one of its holy writings. Ascribe not to any soul that which thou wouldst not have ascribed to thee. And it, it basically says, don't, don't say about a person what you wouldn't have said to you, said about you. Buddhism has this to say in, one, in some of its holy writings, hurt not others in ways you yourself would find hurtful. Confucianism, Confucius says this, uh, that maybe sounded bad, but it, it, what he, he really did say this, uh, do not do to others what you, excuse me, do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. Hinduism has the same thing. Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. So everybody's kind of saying the same thing. So what's the big deal about Jesus then? Well, several things, but maybe the most obvious, and this is interesting, all the other religions, and this is not just all of them, but that's just a smattering of them, all the other religions have this idea, but it's, it's stated in the negative, don't do to this person what you don't want them to do to you. Everybody has it in the negative. I thought that was interesting as I was researching this. Jesus flip-flops it. He makes it a positive. He says, do unto others what you would have them do to you. And he's the only one who does, does this. All the others have, the, in the, have it in the negative. With everyone else, you're safe just kind of not doing anything. You're safe if you just say, I'm, I'm just not going to be mean to that person. I'm not going to be rude to that person. I'm just not going to do anything. With Jesus, though, there's a command to do something. There's a, com there's a positive action there. And with Jesus, um, he's really saying, you know, part of the problem is, uh, is just sitting back and not doing anything. Part of the problem is that apathy and just saying, thinking you can get away with not being mean, where as Jesus is saying, I'm calling you to something more. It's the same thing with even the commandments. There's a lot of those thou shalt nots. Well, here comes Jesus, and he gives a big thou shalt. He doesn't go with the thou shalt nots. He says, I want you to do this, and he sums everything up with a positive action. This is one of the biggest differences between our culture and Jesus. The love that Jesus talks about, and it's like the video said before the service, it's something you do. It's an action. This is what Jesus means when he says to love one another. Uh, it's about doing something. It's, about, it's, an, it's an action word. Our culture is just about what you feel. Uh, I don't know if you saw this. It's a horrendous videotape that's been going around. These teens in Florida, there was a disabled man apparently who, was, who fell into a, a body of water, and these teens are videotaping this man drowning, and they're making fun of him. And the disabled man's calling for help, and they just, it's a, don't even watch it. It's horrible to watch. And you hear these teens yelling at this guy, making fun of him, laughing at him, telling him they're not going to do anything, and the man drowned. And it, people are outraged, rightly outraged about this. Um, and, but what the culture, what the, what the lawyers say is, well, yeah, but they didn't really do anything wrong. They didn't really break the law. There was no law that was broken. You, you have a right to do that. Uh, and people are, like I say, rightly outraged about this. But most of the outrage that's going around right now about this video is it's outrage from behind a computer screen. It's outrage that doesn't really do anything either. That's what our culture is all about nowadays. Um, that's just what our culture does. It, it's all about how you feel. Well, you should feel outraged. And the idea is 
if you feel outraged, then that's good. That's all you're supposed to do. You're, if you feel love, then that's good. That's all you're supposed to do. You watch uh, one of those sad commercials with the puppies or whatever, and you feel bad, and then you think, I must be a good person because I just, I feel bad. And then you post how, how bad you feel on Facebook, and everybody likes it, and you say, yes, I've done my, I'm such a good person, all because I just feel something. When you're, I don't know if you're ever sick or you're going through a difficult time and you post something on social media or somebody hears about it and people will comment, I'm sending you good thoughts. And, uh, or they say, uh, I had one person say, positive energy coming your way now. And I remember thinking, what is that positive? What does that mean? How do you do that? Uh, do you have some kind of machine or something? Um, you know, I, great. I, I, I prefer prayer myself. Pray, I, make sure you're praying at least. Um, some people will say, well, well, thinking of you. We have cards and it says, thinking of you. Well, okay, that's nice. I guess you're thinking of me. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> uh, whatever that means. And Christians too, we're just as guilty of this. We say all these same things. In fact, we'll say hypocritically sometimes, oh, I'm praying for you. Praying for you. But a lot of times there's not any prayer behind those words. Uh, I was convicted of this just tremendously because right? it's something that makes you feel better when somebody's going through something. You say, oh, I'm praying for you. And I remember, I don't say that anymore unless I'm, unless I'm actually praying for you. And sometimes when people, people will come up and tell me something I, they're going through and I quick put my phone out and I plug in, I've got a little note that says prayer and I'm plugging it in. And I always have to tell, people think I'm ignoring them. I'm, t I'm typing in to remind myself to pray because if I say, oh, I'll be praying for you, uh, I really actually want to do it. I think Christians a lot of times would just say, oh, praying for you, and we just think that somehow lets us off the hook and because it's all about how we feel. We feel like we've done our duty if we just feel the right things. That's all that's important nowadays. Feel the right things, think the right things, and you're a good person. Now, imagine, imagine God is up in heaven, and he sees us, and we're drowning, and we're asking for help. And imagine God saying, sending you good thoughts, uh, thinking of you. <laughs> uh, here's the whole point of Christianity, that God saw each and every one of us drowning, and he dove in to rescue us at the cost of his own life. That's the, the whole point of the thing, is that um, Love looks like something. It's an action. It does something. Um, the cro that is what love looks like. It, it means God came down and he rescued us. He did something. Uh, the pastor I sat under for years, Pastor Ben in Brighton, would always, he always says this, For God so loved the world, the most famous verse in the Bible maybe, For God so loved the world that he gave, that he did something. There's an action tied to it. It's not for God so loved the world that he f had warm fuzzies about us. He gave. He did something. God, and God calls us to the same action. And he even goes uh, well beyond what anybody or anybody, anybody else or any other religion even conceived of. Jesus taught us to love not only those who love us, not only our friends and acquaintances. He says, I want you to love your enemies, I want you to pray for those who persecute you. I want you to bless those who curse you. We, when people hit you, I want you to turn the other cheek. I want you to love your enemies. Now, this is something that's not even, you don't even find this in anything close in any other religion in the world. Isn't that wild? Imagine how important this must be to God, that God, the creator of the universe, the one who set everything in motion, broke into human history 2,000 years ago and screamed to us, just love one another. <laughs> This is an important message. Imagine how, it, it, why is this so important? As the video said, God is love. And he looks down and he sees us drowning. He sees what we're doing to everyone. He sees how we're thinking about everyone and how we're treating everyone. And he breaks in and he says, I want you to love one another. I want you to love the stranger. I want you to love this person that doesn't look like you, that doesn't act like you. Love even your enemies. Well, okay. But how are we supposed to accomplish this? We look at the people we dislike and we think, how am I supposed to muster up love for this person? We look at our spouse <laughs> sometimes and we think, ah, how am I, I'm not feeling it today. Uh, how am I supposed to <laughs> love this person? We look at people in the church and we think, 
I'll sit on this side, and uh, they'll sit on that side. I, you know, I don't feel it. How am I supposed to muster love for these people? Uh, John, the writer, has something very interesting to say in uh, the book of 1 John. And the book of 1 John chapter 4 is all about love. And he says this over, the, over a couple of verses. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Uh, but 1 John 4.10 this is love. He's going to help us explain it. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love, John says. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. We love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. John says something that should be a great relief to all of us. He says, it's, listen, it's not about your love. It's not about these feelings that you think you can muster up or you try to muster up. It's about, and it always has been about, God's love for you. We love because he first loved us. And the more we live in his love, John says, the more his love will flow out from us. The more we're close to the source of love, the more we're living in love, as John says, the more that God's love will outflow from us. No matter, no wonder it is so hard to love others. No matter, no wonder it's so hard uh, to love others the people in our church, the people that are co-workers, uh, it's because we try to love people without God. We try to just do it by ourselves without living in the love of God. And so your spouse does something dumb, and they did, they've been doing it for 20 years, and it's no surprise, and they did it again. And the person you've already done so much for and have treated so kindly and so well and have, have done so much for, they just take you for granted, and they treat you like garbage. And you say, very rightly, you say, I don't love this person at all. I'm not feeling it right now, and quite frankly, they don't deserve it. Well, of course you don't feel it, and yes, they don't deserve it, but the reason you're not feeling it is because you've cut yourself off from the source of love, more than likely. It's like uh, if, if you turn off the water at, the, at your house, you cut off the water, and then you turn on the faucet and try to get a glass for yourself. It's not going to, it's not going to come out. When you separate yourself from the source of love, all that's going to happen is you're going to get frustrated. You're going to be trying to get water out of a source that there's, there's no water there. Um, this is ultimately what humans have always done wrong and what we just will continue to do wrong. We try to do things without God. We try to do things of our own strength. God created us to live out his love. That's the purpose for human beings. God created everything, and then he said, who's going to show my love to creation? Who's going to take care of this stuff? Who's going to be my representatives uh, in this world? And he, cre and he says, I'm going to create people. And that was our job. That was our calling. And it still is our calling. You were made to be an, an angled mirror, angled like a 45-degree like a angle. We take the love from God, and we're called to shine it out into the world. And we're supposed to take all the love and the, and the thanks and the praise from the world, and we're supposed to shine it back up to God. That's, that's basically our, our calling, what we're created for. You're a 45-degree angled mirror. We take everything that's good from the world, and we give it back to God, and we take the love from God, and we give it into the world. The problem is the mirror got turned in on itself, and so now the mirror is all about us. It's all about me. So now we say, well, God owes me, and my work owes me, and my spouse owes me, and my children owe me, and my church owe me, and my friends owe me, and the people online owe me, and everything, everybody owes me these things. That's what happens when mirrors get turned in themselves. The mirrors in your car, I don't know if you realize this, they're not for looking at yourself. <laughs> uh, that's not what they were built to do. You can do it. You can shine it. You can put your makeup on or whatever. But you're going to crash when you turn the mirror on yourself. Uh, they're made so you can see others, so you can see other things. If we, all we do is think about how much everybody owes us, we need God to come in and make a mirror adjustment. 
If all we're doing is constantly thinking and acting on what they've done to us, what they've said to us, what they owe us, and all the things I did for them, and now they should do, we need a mirror adjustment. We need God to come in and say, wait a second, let's put this back on the road here, and let's get it off yourself. Instead of going around and saying how much everyone and everything owes you, instead of reminding yourself how much you've done for everyone and how you will never get anything in return and woe is you, remember what our scripture said that we're called to consider ourselves as owing a debt to others. It's the opposite of the way the world thinks. This is, that's the only way out of this mess. We, you need to, and I need to, release the debt that we're holding on to. We're very good at keeping debt and keeping track. Uh, but Paul's saying, release all that debt. Release the debt you are holding over your spouse. Release the debt that you're holding over your family. Release the debt that you're holding over your mother, over your father. Do they deserve you to release the debt? No, they don't deserve it. But neither did you deserve to have the Son of God come and give himself for you. This culture is entirely wrong about love. Love has nothing to do with deserving. Love has nothing to do with what they owe us or what they did to us. In actuality, we are called to think of ourselves as owing others a debt. And here again is that just that everyday holiness, this, this idea that we owe others, we owe the other person a debt of love. It's like that, um, like all those laws, think about all those laws that the United States have. Um, when, when someone's a lawyer, they say that they're practicing law. And I don't know exactly why you use that word practicing law, but I think maybe the idea is you're never going to get done with it. It's, there's always going to be more. You're always practicing. They say the same thing with medicine. You're practicing medicine. Um, I think the idea is the same with holiness. We're, we're, we're called to practice holiness because uh, you never get to the end of it. You never pay, outpay that debt. Was it a general assembly and one of the general superintendents, the church was kind of arguing back and forth about uh, how the church's stance on different things and the general superintendent says, I want you to say this to your neighbor. God loves you and I'm trying. <laughs> well, that's what, we're, that's what we're called to do. God loves you, and I'm trying. Um, people are going to mess up. People are not going to deserve it. People are going to let you down. Uh, and you know what? I think that love hurts. It hurts to not hold that debt against someone. It hurts to love someone so much and have them hurt you back and see the, the bad things they're doing or have this person not change. There's a, at least it's a famous song to me, uh, Love Hurts, I think it's Nazareth. There's a Nazareth, it's kind of biblical. Uh, Nazareth sang the song, Love Hurts. And, uh, and after service, I'll be singing Love Hurts up on stage. <laughs> I'm not really going to be. But what is it? He's a Love Hurts. And what's, what's the song about? It's about how he got his heart broken by some girl and, and he's just done with love. Um, love hurts, but in actuality, love hurts because of what the sacrifice God has made. God's love hurt him terribly. He loved us so much that he did something for us, even at the cost of his own life. It hurt him terribly, but he acted. He released the debt that you owed him, and he had called us to release the debt that we owe others. The, one of the lines in Jesus' prayer that he taught the church, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us, uh, depending on the translation you have. Rather than going around saying what everybody owes you, you are to consider yourself in an unpayable debt to everyone, your spouse, your parents, your coworkers. And when the task is too difficult to do, remember, you're supposed to be drawing love from the source. You're supposed to be going to source. Trying to muster up the love yourself is the same mistake you always make. We love only because God first loved us. And we can forgive because God forgave us. No matter if they deserve it or not, they don't deserve it. But that doesn't matter. We're not called to do what the world says. We're called to something different. We need to go back to that source of love, the source of forgiveness, and let that fresh source of water from the Lord be your constant refreshment and your call to holiness because it is what you were called to do. It's what you were created to do, to shine his love and his forgiveness out into the world. But we need to be in touch and in, in living in his love in order to do that.